All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, someone I've really looked forward to talking with. He was the head of the Ayn Rand Institute. He is a champion for capitalism, free markets, and personal liberty. His name is Yaren Brooks. Yaren, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure. Now, Yarn, for some of my viewers who might not know your full backstory, can you get us up to speed there? Full backstory. That's a long story, and it's a complex. <laughs> the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> sure. Born and raised in Israel, Southern Israeli Army, uh, undergraduate engineering uh, out of Israel, came to the U.S. in 1987, a long time ago. Got an uh, MBA and PhD in finance, was a finance professor for seven years, started a... Um, basically a hedge fund in uh, 1998 uh, and went to went full time at the Ayn Rand Institute in 2000. Uh, today, cha I'm chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute, so switched to being chairman away from CEO in 2017. Moved to Puerto Rico in 2018, January 1st. To be right. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I now spend my time on the uh, hedge fund side and... Uh, I've got a, a YouTube channel, uh, Yvonne Brook uh, Show, and uh, YvonneBrookShow.com, and uh, spent a lot of time just advocating for all those ideas you mentioned up front, and then, of course, still involved with the Institute as chairman of the board. Yeah, but you've got some incredible insights into just, uh, obviously, Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand and her views. Before we get there, I'd love to, to hear your take on what's going on in the United States right now. <laughs> Where do you start? Exactly. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a complete and utter disaster. Uh, you know, we're, we're, I don't know exactly what the nature of the disaster is going to be, but nothing good is coming out of the world we live in right now. We've got a, we've got a president uh, with a character that I w would never believe could ever become president of the United States. Um, who is who has the most authoritarian tendencies of any president ever. And we've got a left, which is authoritarian and barbaric and anti-individualism and anti-everything we believe in. Left and right have become the worst versions of themselves possible. There is no alternative to that present in the U.S. There's no better right. There's no pro-capitalist right. There's just nationalism and authoritarianism of the right and socialism and authoritarianism of the left. And that's it. That's the, that's the entire spectrum. I think most American people still fall, I won't say in the middle, but somewhere better than either one of those alternatives, but they have nowhere to go. So politically, it's a, it's a complete disaster. And of course, culturally, the left has dominated the culture for a hundred years. They've slowly increased their influence. We're seeing the, 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 the manifestation of that today. The, the hippies, the new left of the 60s, uh, today's university professors, the, the leaders, the, the, the people, look, people look up to. And they have created a kind of a, a, a complete subjectivist, more relativist, racist, uh, horrific culture in, in, among young people. Uh, Anti-thinking, pro-emotion. And the consequence of that are, again, the rise of, of, of nutty left and the nutty right. And again, those are the only voices out there. There's, there's very little uh, of the individualism, the capitalism, the, the pro-free markets, the, the pro-American founders. Th yeah. That voice is, is silent today uh, in America. So I'm, I don't know where we go from here. I'm, I'm quite pessimistic, unfortunately. Yeah. And you layer that on top of these corporate bailouts that we've had, you know, that started in 2008. Yes, we haven't got economic issues, right? The Federal yeah. is bailing everybody out, you know, buying individual corporate bonds now, not even just ETFs. Yeah, but right. They would buy ETFs is, is horrific. Uh, bailing out municipalities, few municipal bond purchases, bailing out at the stock market ultimately by providing unlimited liquidity and hinting that maybe one day they will buy stocks. Uh, you know, and then at the federal government level, uh, corporate bailouts, which, of course, we've seen for quite a while. Remember, Ronald Reagan bailed out Chrysler and uh, and, of course, Bush and Obama both bailed out the the car companies, auto companies. And now that's on steroids. So w we've got a completely 
um, dysfunctional economy. You know, uh, uh, Trump used to say the best economy uh, ever. That was complete nonsense. I mean, the economy yeah. was barely growing at 2%. Um, it was struggling and, and it, you know, innovation is down. Productivity is not rising at anywhere near the levels you would expect. We have a, a, an economy that, in a sense, never recovered from 2008-9 and now has received this shock. And given what the government is responding, you know, printing basically $6 trillion out of thin air, I don't see how we recover out of this shock that we just got. That is, I, I, I predict stagnation, you know, for, 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 for the next couple of decades. I just don't yeah. see I think a lot of people have been focused on the money printing and the Fed's balance sheet yarn, but I I see this I, I see the obviously the bad side there, but I get really worried about more and more government intervention, and so we've got these bailouts. So the Fed is let's say intervening, but but really it's it's, it's the government as well. And now we've got the stimulus checks, we've got the PPP program. Yeah, I mean, you go down the, the laundry list, it just means more and more government. And I don't see how the economy is supposed to be increasingly dyna more dynamic to grow while we're burdened with, with government. And it goes back to Atlas Shrugged. And if any of the, the viewers haven't read the book or even watched, the, they've got a couple of movies as well. well movies don't watch the movies. well it still gives you a, an idea of, of kind no, of uh no, no. oh read the book read the okay, book read the book read oh. the book but you'll see oh. that that rand was talking about this the literally the exact same things that are going on right now in 1957 oh. and in fact uh, uh yaron i want to show this to you buddy i bought this hat probably you can tell how old it is i, I work to the gym all the time but i don't know if the viewers can see it there Atlas Shrug, now nonfiction. I mean, that hat might have sold in 2008, nine, when, you know, everybody said, look, Atlas Shrugged is happening right now during the financial crisis, in a sense it was. And you could have even bought that hat in the 1970s when there was a sense that American society was falling apart. And even Ayn Rand thought that Atlas Shrugged, in a sense, was happening all around her. And it just gets worse because today it certainly is going again. And look, I agree with you about everything you said. Uh, you know, when the government starts bailing everybody out, when the government starts deciding who the winners and losers are, when they distort prices, when they distort the allocation of capital, you you don't get the kind of creative destruction the Schumpeter talked about. You don't get capital flowing to the most innovative, to the people who actually create growth. People don't talk about this, but the people who create economic growth are entrepreneurs, the business people, the people who create the jobs, the new products, the the and more so even small and mid-sized business, not just these yes. giant corporations. The entire spectrum of it. And I'm not against giant businesses. I think giant businesses used to be small and they were successful. So good for them. Yeah. Uh, as long as they don't lobby government to protect themselves, good for them. Right. So I think every small business is, who's ambitious wants to be a big business. I just think business across the board is disincentivized from investing, innovating, producing. And then, of course, we have an education system that destroys the minds of young people. So... How are they going to innovate when they can't think themselves out of a paper bag? Uh, and then if you if you but then I don't want to give the Fed get the Fed off, though, because the Fed is doing the same thing. Right. 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 What does it mean that the Fed is printing money? It's if it was printing money and dropping it from helicopters, you know, I, I wouldn't care that much. I mean, I still care. Right. But it wouldn't be that distorted. But what are they doing? They're buying specific assets. They're destroying the most important price in the economy. The most important price in the economy is the interest rate. Yeah, the There's no more important price than interest rate. That's the, the, the price of time and the price of money. And that every other price depends on interest rates. Yet they have destroyed the, uh, the risk premium. They, they made all risky assets equal to or, or very similar to risk free assets. There's no premium for riskiness. They've destroyed what it means to be a bond versus an equity. They destroyed what it means to be a treasury versus a corporate bond versus a high yield bond. So they are unbelievably destructive, not only because they're printing money. The printing money is the least of the problem. It's yeah. how they're distributing that money and, again, bailing out. Because what is what do they do when they buy junk bonds? They're bailing out what we call zombie companies, companies that should be dead and now can raise money in the bond market because the Fed will buy it. They, they you know, so they are... Literally, the Fed is 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 propping up 
the bad and preventing the good from growing. So yeah, and pushing everyone further out the risk curve. I mean, pension funds. That, that, now what they have to do to get yield is they have to go into private equity. They have to invest in companies like Nikola, which is infinitely worse than even Tesla. They have to go into WeWork. They have to go into SoftBank or, or whatever these things just to, to get a decent yield. Yeah, perverts and destroys everything financial. And look, you cannot have a thriving economy. You cannot have economic growth and and and. Um, innovation and prosperity without a robust, free financial market. And the more controlled finances, the more controlled interest rates, yields, uh, bond markets, stock markets, and, and, and corporate finances, the less able an economy is to grow properly. So, so the, the destruction is all around us. And it's again, it's very depressing to look around and see where do we go from here, because there's no voice, not on the right, not on the left. There's no voice who's actually articulating the case for a free market, for, for, for more freedom, not less. For, you know, and yeah. I'm not talking about dismantling the Fed, which is my ideal. Just <laughs> it, return it to the old days when it, all it did was, you know, you know, the old days when they, they used to control the discount rate and, you know, that was in a Fed fund rate and that was it. Now they control the entire yield curve. Yeah. Yeah, you know, well, a few things I want to mention there. First and foremost, for the viewers, the, the main problem with communism from an economic standpoint, obviously there's a, just a, in, there's infinite problems with communism, but from an economic standpoint is there's no price signal. Yes. And so what Yaren's talking about is the Fed is destroying the, the price signal of money, which is one half of every single transaction. So we're, we're going, we're, we're doing all the bad things economically of, of, of communism. That, that's really the, the, the main thrust right there. But uh, also, you know, Yarn, I did a video the other day where I used some charts and I went back, I think, uh, you know, to the early 1900s when government spending was 8%, 8% of GDP. So in other words, the private sector... The no. private sector was 92 percent. No. Now, government spending, when you include state spending, is over 40 yeah. percent of GDP. So by definition, the private sector has shrank to only 60 percent of GDP. Yes. And we know the government doesn't produce anything. It doesn't create anything. Right. It has one function and only one function, which is the protection of individual rights. And to do that, you don't need more than two, three, four percent of GDP. You could cut government spending by 80 to 90 percent tomorrow, and we'd be we'd be richer, more prosperous, and and actually safer uh, if the government actually focused on what on, on protecting us rather than on regulating us and controlling us and, and dictating to us. But absolutely, the difference between uh, the level of freedom that we have today in America and the level of freedom we had in let's say the late 19th century is is astounding, and it's reflected in those numbers. Uh, and again, it's not just the federal government, it's state governments, it's local governments, it's local city councils that now feel like they have the authority to regulate your life and what you can do with your property and what color you can paint your home and what tree you can chop down in your backyard. Oh, yeah. Every aspect is, you know, I lived in California for many years. Every aspect in California of your life is regulated, controlled and dictated to. Um, and, and, uh, and the only reason they can get away with it, going back to Alice Shrugged, is because the great the producers, the the people who actually innovate, produce, grow, make stuff, let's say Silicon Valley, actually go to work every day, produce all that, and get their money taken from them, call it taxes, in order to subsidize control, in order to subsidize the ability of bureaucrats to control our lives. Uh, and in Alice Shrugged, I don't want to give it away, but think about what would happen if suddenly Silicon Valley disappeared, just disappeared. From California. I mean, the state would be bankrupt instantaneously. Uh, it would be poor. It would be declining. It would be crushed. It would be devastated. And in a sense, that happens in Atlas Shrugged. For right. reasons I'll leave, I'll leave for the novel to tell. Yeah, but Yarn, let's think this through, though, because I've always been of the opinion the only reason all those producers, let's call them, are in Silicon Valley is because they make their money with capital gains. I, let's be honest, you know, they're paying themselves like a dollar a year, maybe 200 grand a year or something. Think of all the programmers who make two, three, four hundred thousand a year. Think of all the middle managers. Think of all the networking effects. Yeah. 
yeah. Is a, so I think they're in Silicon Valley because of the networking effect. There's no question. You've got, okay. you've got Berkeley. And once HP started there and then you had Intel, remember venture capital, in a sense, was invented in, in Silicon Valley. Right. Once you got the infrastructure, it's very difficult to leave that infrastructure. And if you're a program and you want to make it, you go to Silicon Valley. You don't think about capital gains taxes. You just want to make it. You're a young kid and you just want to get a job at the best company in the world or, or start a company and you want to go in front of VCs, you're more likely to get capital in, 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 um, in Silicon Valley than you are in Austin, Texas, as great as Austin is. Yeah. Uh, and of course, they pay a lot of capital gains taxes. You know, capital gains in California is taxed like regular income in the state of California. I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, for the for the state tax. The state tax. So, oh, okay. I was talking so federal. The California California tax California government lives off of Silicon Valley capital gains taxes. Right. Right. Yeah. But then let's talk about Puerto Rico because when I was there back in 2013 14, I remember. I mean, I'm sure you've gone through this process where you've got to go register to vote. You've got to get your driver's license. And yeah. and back then, it was kind of a new thing. And I remember being in line at the DMV, which you know takes six hours. <laughs> so but I, everywhere... She used to stay in the line for me. She called me up 10 minutes before she reached the front of the line, and I drove over. And it was oh, that's the way to do it. That, that's <laughs> the way to do it. But every place I was in line, you can tell who the gringos are. It's and cool. and they're there for Act 20 and 22, which is, is for those of you who don't know, is uh, Puerto Rico has this, um, t this tax setup where it's the only place in the entire world, quite literally, where U.S. citizens don't have to pay U.S. tax. So you can lower your cap gains tax on a on few things down to zero and your business income down to a uh, 4%, if not lower. So anyway, when I was in all these lines, you know, I'd talk to everyone. Say, hey, yeah, where are you from? Where are you from? You're from Act 22 or Act 20. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And probably 95% of the people that I spoke with were from California. Yep. And now you look at guys like Schiff, like yourself, uh, Mike Maloney, Harry Dent, uh, Simon Black with Sovereign Man. All of these people, these producers, have now gone to Puerto Rico. I don't know if I maybe put myself in that ring as well. But, you know, but in Puerto Rico, a great example of this, you know, this, who is John Galt? You know, we're, we're, we're getting out of the United States. We see the writing on the wall and it's like, listen, I'm, I'm fed up with it. I'm done. There, there, do a cost benefit analysis and the juice just isn't worth the squeeze. Absolutely. But on the other hand, we're small fry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. I mean when 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 Apple shuts down in California and moves out of Puerto Rico, th that'll be a game changer. But yeah. <laughs> you know, for now we're just too it, it it's too small fry. It's it's a lot of it's motivated by ideology and by, or, uh, you know, we're not quite rich enough. Like like the super rich don't seem to care about taxes as much, and we're not and we're right in the middle there where we where we care a lot because it consumes a huge chunk of our disposable being disposable income, but. No, I, I think that's right. I think people uh, are moving more with their feet, not just to not just to Puerto Rico, but you see it to move to Texas and to yeah. Arizona, Nevada. Uh, you know, Tennessee is a great place to live and has zero state taxes. But it's more than the taxes, and and it's hard to escape because you get that here in Puerto Rico. I mean, it's great that we don't pay federal taxes and all that, but then we have to tolerate aspects of Puerto Rico that are problematic. Uh, the six hour line at the DMV. Why is there a DMV? I still haven't figured out what the purpose of a DMV is. Why can't I sit at home and, uh, you know, have, uh, have, a, have, have a, my, my camera take a picture of me, fill out a form and e and just send it to right. the DMV and get my license downloaded onto my phone. What is this thing that I have to, I mean, it, it, the whole infrastructure in the world is pretty primitive, but in Puerto Rico particularly. So, so there are pluses and minuses to living in Puerto Rico. I think the pluses outnumber the minuses. That's why I'm here. But it's at the end of the day, and this is the point of Alice Shrugged, right? At the end of the day, the battle is an ideological battle. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the only way to turn things around is with better ideas. Uh, Galt Gold only succeeds because he has good ideas and he, and he can convince people about those ideas, not just... Right. Not and, coercion. And, 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 you know, it's that ideological battle that we have to engage in if we're going to turn things around in, in Puerto Rico, in the United States, in the world more broadly. 
uh, and until we convince, you know, if you've read Atlas Shrugged, the, the Dagny Tagats and the, and, the, and the Reardons, the, the giants of the giant entrepreneurs, the real innovators, the people who really move the economy forward, until we convince those people, the great businessmen of our era, uh, that they're being exploited by the system, that they, that they need to take care of themselves, that they need to be more self-interested, that they need to be more focused on their freedom and their liberty. Uh, until we convince them, yeah, a few of us will be in Puerto Rico, and that's great, but the world will not change because of that. Yeah, see, here, what, what comes to mind there is, I think if you just polled the majority of the Americans in the United States, they'd say, who is one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time that would be in that category? And they'd probably all say Elon Musk. Not all, but a lot of them would say Elon Musk. I would say, yeah. But, but let's just, you know, a lot of Americans would. Yeah. And so, but then you look at Musk, and I, I'm not here to say he's great or bad or anything in between, but he has achieved a lot of what he's achieved with the help of government. Well, and some so, of what he's achieved. Look, he made his money at PayPal. There was no government involvement beyond what government is involved in any payment system. But, but he, he, there was no government involvement. He made his money fair and square. I agree. Tesla is all government. He could have done nothing without government, uh, particularly the state of California. Hundreds of, mil hundreds of millions of dollars went into that company from California. And of course, uh, tax credits and all the other stuff. Uh, his solar panel business, all government. How can we get these people, these, these producers, these entrepreneurs, like we read about in Atlas Shrugged, away from the system if they're so ingrained in the system and they've become dependent on it? That's real my question. They become dependent on, I don't think they become dependent on it. Okay. They can't imagine an alternative. It, it, this, is a, this is all ideas in the end. Okay. It's not money. They have enough money forever. It's not about more market share. Or, you know, and, and the fact is that they can't imagine an alternative. Um, and uh, they are ideologically committed to it. And this is, again, the point of Alice Shrug. Alice Shrug is about a philosophy. It's about a philosophy that says that the reason the businessmen are tied to government is because they feel guilty. And, and the character Reardon is the most powerful character in that sense in Atlas because he has to move the biggest distance in order, to, in order to be redeemed, if you will, in order to gain access to the valley. Right. Because he, in the beginning of the novel, is very conventional in his ideas. He's a great entrepreneur, but he's very conventional in his ideas. And his, his, he basically feels the tug of guilt. His family pulls at him. He thinks that that's what morality is, taking care of others, giving to others. And he knows deep down that that's wrong, but he doesn't have an alternative. So he doesn't know how to, how to handle himself. And he is easy prey then. Now, in the book... He's a hero, so he's not. But in real life, he's easy prey to the uh, intellectuals who mm -hmm. tell him he's a bad person, who's just, you know, you, you, you hear uh, Bill Gates, it's all luck. He had the right genes at the right time, you know, in the right computer, in the right place, in the right school, and all this BS. Uh, it's just luck. And uh, therefore, he didn't build it. If you listen to Obama, you didn't build that, right? It's the, your, your kindergarten teacher. Or it's the government that produced the infrastructure. And they, they literally buy into this stuff. I don't believe it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game. I don't believe they're just putting on an act. Although they might be, in a sense, that they think that's what this society expects of them. But why would they think that they should do what a society expects from them? And that's also the ideological question. So I think they bought into, you know, there's no question in my mind that somebody like Bill Gates has read John Rawls, the famous uh, Harvard philosopher, because he, he speaks like it's right out of the, it, John Rawls's theory of justice. He's bought into that philosophy. Until we can show them the evil of that philosophy and how wrong it is and replace it, in my view, with Ayn Rand's philosophy, we're doomed to continue this. And I think they are legitimate entrepreneurs out there. I mean, I, I, you know, Steve Jobs did not go groveling to government for, for any favors, any goods. He, he played the game because the government was there placing barriers in front of him and, and, and he had to knock those barriers down. So he played the game to try to do that. Bill Gates is the same way. If you look at Bill Gates's history, he tried to avoid government until they came with the Justice Department knocking on his door and tried to break up his company. And right. then he realized he had to play the game. And yeah. if you look at Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos has tried to stay away from government, try to stay away from politics, try to stay away from lobbying, 
his reward, by the way, was that Microsoft just got a big contract. The Defense Department just gave a big contract to Microsoft and not to Amazon because Trump hates Amazon. So it's all about, I mean, our politicians have their tentacles in everything. Yeah, and right. if you're a businessman and you want to survive, you better play along. Now, what we need to give them is the backbone. You know, one of the great tragedies, in my view, one of the most disgusting things that I, that I observe in the world out there is when Congress brings in front of them a successful CEO, oh, like yes. Mark Zuckerberg, yeah. or, or in the past, there was like CEOs of auto companies or the CEO of banks, even banks, right? And they lecture them. Yeah. On yeah. Um, the derivatives put for, you know, on, on, on derivatives when the congressmen know zero about any of the, like they, they, they'll ask them about CDOs or CMOs. When if just one of these CEOs would turn around and say, uh, Congressman, would you mind telling me what a CMO or CDO is? They have no clue what they're talking about. They, they're all they don't even know how a checking account works. Exactly. Yeah. So these, these people sitting up there who, who have the power of the gun, the power of government behind them, who have not employed a human being in their life, who have not run a business, who know nothing about running a business, who have produced zero, actually negative, because everything they do in government is a drain on production, lecturing to the most productive people in our society, to the people who actually employ people, create jobs, build jobs, do the best that they can in a horrific environment. And they're lecturing them and telling them what they can and cannot do, what they should and shouldn't do. That is a massive in injustice. And again, we will win when one of those CEOs stand up and says, you have no right to ask me these questions. It's none of your frigging business. Go away, you're unproductive, you're, you're, you're nobodies, and I will not speak to you and walks out of that room. And when that happens, we'll know a revolution is starting. Yeah, boy, wouldn't that be awesome? It, one thing that surprises me, it, when you hear the, the rhetoric for people who, let's say, protest, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, on the left and, and the right, you know, going back to the Tea Party, is why everyone can't agree that smaller federal government is good. Because you hear on the left, you know, we can't have these lobbyists, the, the, the big corporations have too much control, they have too much power. Yeah, but if you just reduced the size of the federal government and reduced how much power they had, then there, you wouldn't really have crony capitalism because there's no politician to pay off because they don't have any power. They don't I mean, have they don't have the ability to do that. You assuming they care? They care about cronyism. Cronyism is a facade. It's an excuse for them. The left doesn't want smaller. The left doesn't want lobbyists to go away. They want the lobbyists to be employed by the government. They want full control over these businesses. They want to own the means of production. Right. And who? And then, and then the government is the lobbyist. The government is the CEO. The government is all these people. And the right has never wanted the lobbyists to go away because they want the power. They don't want to give up the power of being able to control. I mean, these congressmen love the fact that they can put in front of them these incredibly productive individuals and these individuals, these CEOs of these companies that have to grovel before them. It, 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 it gives them the reason for living. They thrive off of power. They thrive off of their ability to control and manipulate other people. And Ayn Rand, again, describes this perfectly in Atlas Shrugged. Yep. You know, in Wesley Mouch and, and the different uh, operatives. In, and, and she also describes the kind of CEO who thrives in this environment. She has many of the CEOs, many of the businessmen in Atlas Shrugged are the villains because they're the kind of CEOs that rise up in an environment where you get favors from the government. And they enjoy getting favors of the government. And it's this, you know, constant horse trading between the politicians and the businessmen, the, the bad businessmen and the productive businessmen, the real geniuses, the real people who are pushing civilization forward. They are the ones everybody wants to exploit. Everybody wants to take advantage of. And, and the left and the right are not honest about not wanting cronyism. They thrive. In, I mean, look at these politicians. They enter politics poor. And, and you can, you'll can you see this with AOC or any politician. What was she, a bartender when she came into politics? Something like that. Right. She leaves politics, she will be wealthy. Every single one of them, when they leave politics, are wealthy. How does that happen? Because the salary is not high. They're not, they're not producing anything. They're not creating anything. So how do they get wealthy? Well, because people are paying them to buy favors. Now, it might not be explicit suitcases full of cash, but 
as soon as they leave politics, suddenly they're offered $250,000 to speak at Goldman Sachs. Why? Because Goldman Sachs believes that if you're in politics before, you have connections, you have a way in, and you will, you know, you'll, you'll provide favors. Every single one of these congressmen finds ways to leverage their political position to make a lot of money for themselves. And not only do they get the kick of having power over other people, they also make the money out of it. So they have no incentive, zero incentive, to rein in government, to shrink it. They thrive on control and on the power, both financial and, um, and, and just power over people that they gain from having, they want more lobbyists. More lobbyists means more power. Yeah, and see, yeah, and see, you're you're getting people. I know the the pushback to that is always, well, we just need to vote in the right people. Well, yep. what you don't understand is that if if someone's trying to get into this position in the first place, by definition, they're going to be a very poor character. Because think of what it takes to be a good quote unquote good politician. You have to be. You have to have no ethics whatsoever. I mean, zero. You have to be able to lie. You have to be able to have no principles. You just go with the wind. Whatever you whatever you think will get you the most votes, that's what you're going to believe, and that's what you're going to say. And so you have you're you're drawing in the worst of our society to have the most control. But it's worse than that, because <laughs> it is. Because what do the people want? It's not like the people who say we just need better leaders know what a better leader looks like. Like if I re people ask me, you run, why don't you run for president? Now, I, I wasn't born in the U.S., but let's say I could run for president. I'd say because I would lose in a landslide. It would be a massive waste of time. I would literally lose in a landslide because the fact is that nobody wants me as president. There are like 10 people on planet Earth who want me as president. <laughs> it's not. We get exactly the politicians we deserve as a culture. Right, right. People who complain about the quality of the politicians are the people who voted those politicians in. And when somebody like me came to them with radical ideas, they said, oh, no, that's too radical. Oh, no, no, that's too uh, crazy. Or what about old people? What about Social Security? What about my, you remember the plaques that the Tea Party had? You know, we want to shrink government. We want, you know, don't tread on me. And then they'd have a plaque saying, keep your hands off of my Medicare. You know, the yeah. biggest socialized <laughs> health care system in the world, Medicare, they want, they, they think that's, you know, consistent with the Constitution and consistent with free markets. So right. it's not like any of these people, including the Tea Party, know what a good politician would look like. And it's not like any of them would vote for one if such a human being existed. So it's they vote for the politicians that reflect their ideas. When the culture is good, when the culture believes in free markets, you know what will happen to politicians? They'll become true believers because that's the only way to get elected is to become a free market capitalist. Right. But we don't believe in free market capitalism, the people out there. So why would any politician advocate for that? Yeah. So well, let's talk about opportunity to, to, to change the world here. And I, I think that it's definitely an uphill battle. But with the Internet and the kind of the, the, de, uh, the decentralization of, of the media, now maybe we've got – we can it's kind of scrappy here and there, but maybe we've got a little bit of – a way to get the message out to where more people will see it, more people will hear it, and more people will start to see, hey, this is really what we need to start doing. It's, it's about less government, not more government. It's our only opportunity that we have. We're, we're, there's so few of us, and there's, it's such a tiny voice. Um, we have to start speaking up. And, and yes, I think the internet provides us with this amazing opportunity. A marginal cost of zero for adding another person uh, mm -hmm. to watch your video. Um, and the challenge is, of course, to gain size, and it's a numbers game at some point. And the other challenge is to have the right message. And I think that the challenge with the liberty movement is, uh, you know, and, and, and I know this is somewhat self-serving, but I think it's also the truth. I think the biggest tragedy of the liberty movement is they don't take Ayn Rand seriously enough. I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think the great giants of the liberty movement of the past took her seriously enough. The Von Mises, the Hayeks, the Friedmans, the, the people of that generation didn't take it. And I think the people, the great economists of this generation don't take it seriously enough. You cannot change a culture on economics alone. Nobody cares about economics. People don't vote their pocketbook. People vote what they believe is right versus wrong. People vote their morality. People associate with the heart, but it's really the mind. They vote what they think is right. They, they vote what they think is moral. 
what Ayn Rand provides, and she's the only one in the liberty movement to provide this, and this is why she has to be adopted more broadly and has to be talked about more broadly. She provides an actual philosophy of freedom, philosophy of limited government, philosophy for individual living their lives based on a new moral code, based on a new approach to human life, the individual human life, and as a result of that, a new approach to government. But people, you know, if we want to change the world, we have to challenge the left and the right, the conventional left and right, on their grounds. And that means on their philosophical grounds. We have to challenge their philosophy. Look, their economics is one big, unbelievable failure. If people cared about economics, we would have won a long time ago. Mises and Friedman are far better economists than anybody the left has. They made better arguments, more articulately, that actually matched reality. We would have won it by now. The fact is that we have it. We're losing and losing fast. It's because we've never taken up the philosophical argument. Ayn Rand was alone in taking that up. And until the liberty movement pivots to become more objectivist, more oriented around Ayn Rand's ideas, more oriented around the morality of liberty, the morality of capitalism, the morality of freedom, the morality of individualism, we don't have a chance. And, and that's the big weakness we have. We can go online and talk and talk and talk about economics, but I think that only has a limited effect because people, you know, there's people starving over there. What am I supposed to do about that? Yeah, well, let's go into that, Yarn. Why, why is personal freedom and liberty morally correct? Well, because, what is, because morality should be about you, me, right, about the individual. Morality should not be about the other. Your life is what's precious to you. And your whole orientation as an individual should be, how should I live the best life that I can live? Under what conditions, in what environment, what must I do to make my life the best life that it can be? Every second is precious. Every moment of your time, you will never get back again. Your life is all you have. And, and morality needs to be focused around that. Now you ask your question. For an individual who recognizes that to live well, he must use his mind to, to think. What kind of world, what kind of a political system sh does he want to live under? Well, a world that leaves him free to use his mind to discover the best values that can lead to his happiness. Right, right. So what does he need politically? Freedom. He needs to be left alone to use his mind. And we know that the biggest threat of force, coercion, is that it stops the mind. It restricts your options. It makes thinking impossible about those things that the gun takes out of your of the scope of thought. So if you're, if you're a rational individualist, a rational egoist, what you want is get rid of coercion. Get rid of force. And then you say, okay, to do that, I need to establish an institution, call it government, whose sole responsibility, only job, is to, is to get rid of the bad guys, to eliminate force as a way in which human beings interact. So not for the purpose of some social utility, maximizing social well-being, good economics, who cares about all that? Just for the purpose so that I can pursue my values, use my mind free a force so that I can live the best life that I can live. That's the orientation. The orientation needs to be away from the others and respect. You see, I think Hayek makes a massive mistake by, by saying, well, central planning is bad because the central planner um, is not, in a sense, doesn't have enough information. And if he did, if you could create a supercomputer that did, would it be okay then? No. Central planning is bad because the central planner can never, ever metaphysically can never choose values for me because by definition a value is what i want not what he wants for me right right, right. that is the essential so you have to orient everything to the individual to the individual's ability to think and pursue their own life i mean one of the big mistakes conservatives make is they say well people people are irrational and therefore we want small government because Politicians are going to be irrational, and, uh, and we, need a, we need to have checks and balances to prevent irrationality from the government. But if people are irrational, then they can't take care of themselves. And if they can't take care of themselves, then what are you going to do? Somebody has to help them. Right? And again, you have to shift that focus. No, individuals are primarily rational. 
We are brilliant at taking care of ourselves when allowed to do so. And all of history suggests that that is the case. So what we need is the freedom to be able to take care of ourselves. And if there's some people under certain circumstances who can't take care of themselves, that's not a problem. We can help them easily. But the majority, the overwhelming majority of people have enough of a, a, a can be rational and when they are rational can thrive and flourish and achieve happiness. So we need to be positive, not negative. We need to push for a positive view of man and a positive view of his abilities and a positive view of the morality of man seeking his own happiness, which is what this country is founded on, right? It's founded on two ideas, reason, man's capacity to think for himself and to produce and to create, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are the two foundations for the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, and ironically, when you focus on those aspects, you get better economic growth. And then you get, it, it's like the free hand, you know, you, you get a lot better stuff by not trying to focus on that. Yeah, let, let's use someone, just to try to illustrate your point, Aaron. let's use someone like Mother Teresa. She's just a stereotypical good person that was altruistic, that helped others. And so w let's just start with answering the question, was Mother Teresa, from a moral standpoint, looking at it from, uh, from, from Ayn Rand's vantage point, was, was that morally correct, what, the way she lived her life? And if so, no. why... No. Absolutely not. She, it's a waste. She wasted her life. She was miserable. She was unhappy. If you read her diaries, you see how awful a life she lived. Um, she could constantly questioned what she was doing, why she was doing it, you know, what the reward was in some afterlife, mythical afterlife. She had, to, she had to create a fantasy to justify what she was doing. I mean, the world is, is heaven enough if, if you know how to live your life properly. And that's what morality is about. It's about living your life properly and creating heaven on earth, achieving your own happiness here on earth, not about an afterlife. So, no, she lived an immoral life, an immoral life. And she helped very few people. And, and if you follow Mother Teresa, you know that what she did is she helped people who were starving not starve. But that's it. She refused to help them succeed because she believed the meek shall inherit the earth. So you wanted meek people because they were good at suffering. Poverty was a good, not a bad thing in the world. But contrast to, which I do in my talks, to a Bill Gates. Yeah, yeah. Who really changed the world. Helped hundreds of millions of people, if not several billions of people. Uh, his computers today, ubiquitous. You can't get aid into the worst places in Africa without using a computer to make efficient the supply chain and reduce the cost of all the goods that you're providing them. Everything in the world today relies on some of the innovations that Microsoft had in the early days. And yet he helped many, many more people than Mother Teresa, but also made a lot of money for himself while doing it as a, as a value for value trade. Lives a fairly, what looks like a fairly happy life. He, he's successful and he's, he seems to be happy and enjoying himself. He's not considered moral. Why? Because he's not suffering. He's not in pain. He's not in anguish. He's actually happy. So the culture views happiness and success as vices and suffering and anguish as, as, as virtues. Ayn Rand says the exact opposite. If you have actually used your mind, pursued your values, lived a full life, made something, created something, built something, you're a good person. That's what life should be about. It's not about other people. And by the way, if you do that, you'll help many, many more people by orders of magnitude than the Mother Teresa's of the world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, l let me outline my kind of personal belief system or, or what I've, uh, you know, what I've come to uh, the conclusion. Obviously, I always keep an open mind, but this is kind of the way I've always seen it. And once I uh, read Atlas Shrugged and then I, I, I retired in 2012 as an entrepreneur for many years and I've, I've had thousands of employees. The last business I had had over 100 employees. So I, I've really seen it from both sides. When I was in college, I didn't have a you know, two nickels to rub together. So I've been on an, a, an employee, an employer, everything in between. But and, and then I was raised Christian. I still consider myself a Christian. So w what I always or the way I saw it was it starts with being honest with yourself. You have to be honest with yourself on what your personal strengths and weaknesses are. And this is if you're trying to do good, let's say, the, the, way, the, the typical or the proper definition of, of the word good. If you're trying to do good, you got to start with being honest with yourself. And if your skill set is that of Bill Gates 
and you want to do good, you've got to do exactly what he did. Let's say to to start uh, Microsoft that he had like 400,000, I think he had 400,000 seed capital, something like that. If he would have given that away to charity, let's say, everyone would have said, oh my gosh, he's doing good. Look, look at what a moral act. But but he didn't do that. He pursued his own self-interest. And in doing so, now he's worth, let's say, $100 billion, where he can do far more good now. And plus, he's you know changed the world. He's got all these uh, you know employees at Microsoft. You know, they're, they're basically the entire so uh, state of Washington. Buying but, into the mythology that leads us towards socialism, right? That that is yes. Okay, <laughs> so why, tell me how am I, how am I leading us towards socialism? Because the whole approach there is that good means to other people, but that's wrong. Bill Gates should have not given the four hundred thousand to charity because he wanted to have fun. In other words, he wanted to enjoy his life. He wanted to achieve something and make something, not so he could give it away afterwards. Who cares whether he does philanthropy afterwards? He has provided more good for himself by living a full life and more good to other people by employing them, by creating millions of jobs all around the planet, and by every time somebody bought a Microsoft product, was they like better or worse? Well, You're right. the trade, You're right. They're more productive, right, right. Well, then, for whatever reason, they felt that $100 was better used buying a Microsoft product than any other use. They preferred the Microsoft product on the $100. Their life was better off. Bill Gates is a moral giant for having created Microsoft. Forget his philanthropy. His philanthropy is irrelevant to the equation of morality. Philanthropy is neutral morally, in my view, or un unimportant. It's a trivial issue. Yeah, then you want to give some money away? Fine, who cares? You've already changed the world in deep, meaningful, substantial ways. And by the way, you did it in the most moral way possible by making your life better at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So, we, yeah, I didn't say it the right way. We, we completely agree. I was just trying to look at it from a standpoint of someone trying to do good. But yeah, we yeah, we're definitely but, on the same but page. You're still buying into the idea that doing good means helping other people. I say doing good is making your life the best life that it can be. Right. Whatever. You could be a social worker. I have nothing against social workers. So I don't have anything against philanthropy. If you decide, let's say you're born with a lot of money, you, you inherited a lot of money, and you decide that what you really enjoy doing, what really gives you satisfaction, what really rationally is consistent with your values, is to, in a rational, systematic way, give it away and, and enable people to thrive through your giving the money away. Fine. If you go through that, probe, if you're not doing it out of guilt, if you're not doing it because this is the only way to do good in the world. So the focus needs to be on your values on what right. makes you happy and what will lead to your success in this world. And I believe, you know, I don't believe in God, but if I believed in a God, I believe that if you do good in this world, he's going to reward you whether you follow this scripture or that scripture, you do this stuff. Otherwise, he's a pretty nasty God. If, if, uh, if, if you're honest and you're doing good stuff here and, and you don't get rewarded unless you identify with a particular deity and not with another one. So forget about the afterlife. I don't think it exists, but forget about it and just live the happiest, most successful life you can right now on the planet. And that doesn't By pursuing be, your own self-interest, yeah. Uh, it's not about being hedonist. It's not about momentary pleasures. We know that, you know, because we've lived a while, right? That real happiness comes from long-term thinking, from long-term planning, from execution, from achieving meaningful values, from the pursuit of something that has substance. It doesn't come from just, you know, pleasure for the sake of pleasure. Not that I'm against pleasure, but just that that is the guiding thing of your life. So, it, it, you know, the whole way in which people think about morality needs to change. It yeah. needs to change about thinking of the other, altruism, to thinking about self, egoism, which is as a long tradition going back to Aristotle. And Ayn Rand, I think, is, is, is the, 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 the most important thinker in that tradition. And, until, and then once you do that, if what I care about is my own life, mm -hmm. now I care about my own freedom. It's obvious, right? And I want to produce, I want to make. I don't want, see, if Elon Musk was an egoist, he wouldn't take government handouts because government handouts undermine and undercut any achievement he makes. And he knows it and it eats at him. So if he really cared about his soul, then he wouldn't do it. There's a, there's a magnificent scene in The Fountainhead. 
Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, yeah. where this architect has designed this beautiful bank building, and he's a starving artist. He has no money, nothing. And he presents the plans to the board of this bank. And they say, great, we love it. We're going to give you million, you know, whatever you, we're going to give you a huge amount of money to build the building. But we want to make a few changes. And the changes they make are going to undercut his integrity. And he says, no. And they say, but you're going to get a lot of money. And he says, the money's not worth it if I have to sell my soul for the money. And he walks away and he goes, works as a manual labor in a, in a quarry, uh, you know, uh, uh, digging up rocks in order to sustain himself. But he's willing to do that to fight for his integrity. So being an egoist is not about the material things. It's about your integrity. It's about your honesty. It's about your, your, your commitment to facts and reality and sticking to those and living through those. And somebody like that does not want to be told what they can and cannot do, what they, where they can and cannot open a business, how much they pay their employees and what to build and what not to build. Yeah. How does integrity and pursuing or being an egoist or pursuing your own self-interest, how does how do those two things intertwine? Because some would say, Yarn, that, that, that they're antithetical. Yeah, so well, to, to, to really dig deep into that would require an hour. But, but it, <laughs> it, it, to, to, to you is to read The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand. It's a little book. And the first essay is called The Objectivist Ethics. And she talks about why integrity is essential, not just nice, but essential yeah. for being an egoist. Um, and, and I'll give you the outline. Basically, to be an egoist, the most important thing one must respect is the mind. Yeah. You must respect the fact that your only means of knowledge, your only means of providing for yourself is by thinking. Emotions are not tools of cognition and revelation is not real. So the only thing you have is your mind, your reason, your rationality. Integrity is just an aspect of that. If you think certain thoughts and you think those things are true and then you act against them, you're negating the value of your own mind. You're negating the value of your own ideas. You're negating the value of your own thinking, which then undermines your own life psychologically and ultimately existentially as well. And in Ayn Rand's, in the book, in The Fountainhead, she's got two characters, the one who sells out and does whatever people, and the one who doesn't. And you can see, and the lot, you know, it's a, it's a fiction, so it's not a true story, but you can see the trajectory of their lives and you know people who've lived those lives, and you know that it's true. That is, uh, people with no integrity cannot be happy. Elon Musk, deep down, cannot be 100% whole with himself. Even as much as he's achieved, he cannot be completely whole with himself because he knows that he has sold out in, in important ways in his life. And that's sad, because I think Elon Musk deserves happiness, given how productive of a genius he is. I think that the fact that he sold out and, and went for the government subsidies and the government goodies is, is truly sad. Yeah. Do you think there's an argument for a higher purpose, like from his standpoint, saying, well, if I take the government goodies, then I'm achieving, let's just say that uh, his main goal, and I'm not saying it is or isn't, but his main goal is like global warming. He says, if I can conquer global warming by taking this government hand, then maybe it's justified. Is, is, is that an argument or not? Certainly, I think it's the way he rationalizes it to himself. Yeah. But I think I'll go back to a point you made earlier about honesty. I think, I think if he was honest with himself, A, is Tesla really going to save the world from global warming? Right. We all know it's not. Uh, if, if global warming is real, we know it's not. And if it's not real, it's, it, it's just a way for him to uh, build his toys. And I don't think he does it for the money. I think he does it for the toys at somebody else's expense. Uh, so, and, and, and build his prestige and, and just have fun, you know, the, 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 the fun of building an automobile the way he wants to see it, but at somebody else's cost. So I think if he was honest, he would realize that what he's doing is just rationalizing, not actually living by his principles. And I think, again, to the extent that a person doesn't live by their principles, to that extent, they can't in the end be happy and, and can't live the best life that they can live in this life. Yeah. Okay, so I've taken up a lot of your time, Yarn. I, I sincerely appreciate it. Let me just dive into one more thing here before I let you go, because you touched, and I'm reading from my notes, you touched on being rational. We, we've got to use our mind. And what I see, the, the biggest change that I see since, since when I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s compared to now 
is back then people would always use the terminology as an example. I think, yep. Yarn, I think we should take a right here. Uh -huh. Yarn, I think the weather, it's 75 degrees. Now, and it's just the way that th they talk, you know, uh, Yarn, I feel like we should take a right here. Yarn, I feel like it's about 75 degrees. And I know it's, it's a very subtle thing, but it seems, my point is it seems like we've gone from a society of valuing thinking and intelligence and, and rational thought to a society that that puts feelings as priority number one. And I, I know that goes into postmodernism and I and you don't have to expand on that, but I'd just like to get your your brief thoughts on that. Absolutely. No question. The the biggest the biggest enemy we have today is is emotionalism, the fact that emotions are being elevated to the most important thing in the world. It's a consequence of John Dewey's theory of education, which has dominated our schools, certainly since the 1960s, even before that. To some extent, I think even the people in the 70s or 80s were pretending that they cared about thinking, but were actually already on the path to the feeling. You saw that with the, with the new left in the 1960s, with the hippie generation and all that. And remember, they're, the, they're, the, they're my age now, right? Or, or even older than me right now. So this feeling stuff has been around in American culture for a long time. It's just, and then the differences between the right and the left become what the right feels versus, versus what the left feels. And it's just a combat of feelings. Feelings, cultures that emphasize feelings always end up with violence. Because once you abandon reason as the way in which we interact, facts and logic as the way to decide what's true or what's not, then how do you decide? Well, at that point, the only way to decide is who has bigger muscles. Might makes right is the only way to make decisions in an emotionalist society. And we're seeing that. We'll, we'll see more of that. The government is becoming more violent in the sense of imposing its control more. People are demanding more violence from the government. And it, people themselves, I think, are becoming uh, you know, more violent you know, in, in in, in the respect of their tribe versus other tribes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Silencing speakers on campuses, firing people uh, from the editorial board of the New York Times because they published an op-ed some people found offensive, uh, you know, not publishing stuff on Twitter because it's offensive, because people's feelings are hurt. Um, people start using feelings. It really is the end of civilization. And th it's, it's, this is the point that makes me so pessimistic yeah. is it's very hard to reverse because it's so ingrained in our educational institutions. Yeah. All right, Yarn, we'll go ahead and leave it there. Boy, this has been a just a fascinating conversation. For my viewers and listeners who want to find out more about your content and what you do, where can they go? Uh, YouTube, Yaron Brook Show, and um, Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter, just Yaron Brook, Y-A-R-O-N-B-R-O-O-K. And... Uh, you know, if you want to find out more about Ayn Rand, AynRand.org, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D.org. All right, Yarn. Thank you again, and I cannot wait to do this in the future. Sounds good, and we should do it in Puerto Rico next time. <laughs> I, if I can get out of lockdown, I'll join you there, and we'll have a mojito on the beach and talk Ayn Rand. <laughs> Fantastic. Look forward to it.